Europe is only 8% of the Earth's landmass. But between 1492 and 1914, Europeans conquered what colonized more than 80% of the world. The century of Spain and Portugal was followed by the century of France, and then came the century of Britain, and finally the century of the United States. Science and technology played a central role in the dominance of the West over the past four centuries. From the scientific revolution in the 17th century, to the industrial revolution in the 19th century, to the information revolution of the 20th century, the West led the world in scientific discovery and technological advancement. Science and technology raised the standard living of the West above that of the rest of the world. Dominance in science and technology was what allowed the West to subjugate the rest and call the shots. But can the West maintain its lead in innovation? What does the arms race between the West, China, and Russia tell us about who has the upper hand right now? Are political freedom and capitalism still giving the West the edge? We talked to the former chief scientist of Airbus to find out. Hi, I'm David Wu, a former IMF economist and Wall Street strategist with a 20-year track record of making actionable predictions about the big story shaping our world tomorrow. I have the great honor today to be joined by Jean-Francois Genest. Jean-Francois spent nearly 40 years in the aeronautics space and defense industry in Europe. He was indeed no less than the scientific director at the EADS group, now of course Airbus, for 10 years. He was a professor at the Sokolov Institute of Science and Technology in Moscow, you know, while this institution, by the way, was still under working under MIT license. And he's currently the CEO of a startup Warpod, which has just been awarded a patent for its infinite specific impulse space propulsion engine, which Jean-Francois tells me that if it works out one day, it could basically help us get to Mars in less than one week. It's amazing to have you on the show, Jean-Francois. I don't I can't imagine a better person more qualified than you to join me to talk about sort of uh, hypersonic missiles and, and a lot of related issues. In April this year, you know, a leak of US classified military documents confirmed that China has developed a new long range hypersonic missile that is probably able to evade US air defenses. Okay, and according to one of the leak reports, you know, basically China successfully tested this new missile essentially back in February, and the missile is called DF-27. And let me quote the report, okay, from the US intelligence. The DF-27 is designed to enhance China's ability to hold targets at risk beyond the second island chain and possesses a high probability of penetrating US ballistic missile defense. And by the way, and of course, an earlier Defense Department report suggested that the DF-27 has a range of 5,000 to 8,000 kilometers, meaning that it can target um, any, basically strike any target east or basically Southeast Asia, a large part of the Pacific, including even Guam. So that's a sort of the intro. But the point here is, is as an expert in aeronautics and defense, Jean-Francois, can you explain to us layman, okay, in layman's language, just how significant was this technical breakthrough on the part of China? And what does this tell you about the state of engineering and science in China today? There is a DF-27 Mach 5, an ICBM, in fact, uh, eight, about, you told me, you said it, uh, 8,000 kilometers range, two stages, uh, and uh, not like GPS, not by satellite. And this is a glider, which is something which is important. I will come back on it later. Then there is the DF-17, uh, which uh, is a, a lower range, hypersonic glider also. And there is the uh, YJ-21, max 6 to 10. So 6 in the beginning for the, the cruise and 10 in the uh, final, uh, uh, in fi final range. Uh, hypersonic, anti-ship, uh, and uh, uh, it flies high on the contrary of the uh, Russian Zircon, which is anti-ship also, Mach 9, uh, and its range is uh, much, much bigger, 7,500 kilometers, compared to the 2,000 and maybe a bit less of the Zircon. Uh, for the high altitude the gliding hypersonic missiles, now uh, they are a real breakthrough 
in the sense that they can attack the countries in new ways, uh, which uh, uh, have never been faced before. So now the main problem caused by such missiles is their detection and the following of their tra trajectory with radars and with anti-missile systems, uh, and uh, uh, the fact that they are maneuverable. Then there is an, another problem is that these missiles, uh, at least the gliders, uh, move into the stratosphere. And the stratosphere, we, we had the example recently of the Chinese balloon, uh, which was uh, uh, hit by uh, some uh, American weapons and when it was flying over America. Uh, and uh, there, there are not too many uh, weapons and uh, it's a kind of a, a, a new place for, for war. The fact that they have tested positively such uh, missiles, like the DF-27, uh, shows that Chinese science uh, has passed uh, barriers in terms of mastering hypersonic speeds, both at the aerodynamic flow level. I mean, two, there are two characteristics for this environment when you have the missile penetrating the air and also uh, propulsion, because uh, pro propelling uh, hypersonic is something which is quite complicated and the second also system level because you have heat management because you are the it's going to 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 heat a lot uh, on the one hand and also the telecommunications to for guiding the missile because you have you are going to have the plasma around the, the missile so it, it, there are a lot of problems for this but it means that they have passed some barriers not all the barriers but some uh, uh, so you need to know that the, the hypersonic begins at Mach 5 uh, and above, of course. But under Mach 5, this is not considered as hypersonic. Uh, so Mach 5 is a lower limit. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I told you about the Chinese missiles, uh, Mach uh, 5 to 10 max, and Mach and 10 is at the end uh, of, of, of the range, uh, just for accelerating to hit the target. Uh, so we can consider that the, the main uh, slot of time for their trajectory is Mach 5, 5, 5 to 6. Um, it's to be compared to the Russians. The avant-garde flies at Mach 27, so much, much uh, higher. And so I would say that if uh, we try to, 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 to see where the Chinese are compared to the West and to the uh, to the Russians, they are in between. They are ahead of the West, which cannot and uh, is not able today, and we will come back on this later, uh, to master uh, hypersonic missiles. Uh, but they are, in my opinion, pretty far away from the Russians. <sighs> on May 4th, you know, the Pentagon confirmed that Ukraine actually shut down a Russian hypersonic missile using the American Patriot Missile Defense System. And this made huge news. It was reported everywhere. Do you think this is actually possible, given the huge disparity in spread between the Kinzel and the, um, and the Patriots when it comes to their speed? Uh, so I don't say it didn't occur, of course. And that there might be disinformation both on the Russian side or the American side. On the other hand, uh, it might have occurred by chance. You know, you, you shoot at something and by chance you you, you kill the target. You, you, <laughs> this is more my opinion. I think that maybe they killed the Kinjal, uh, but uh, even if the, if it was on purpose, but it was by chance. And I don't think such a, an experiment is reproducible, basically. Uh, I, you know, they, I, as I said before, they cannot pursue the missiles. Uh, they are coming too 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 quickly. You cannot, uh, you know, uh, uh, attach the the missile to to to, to the target uh, in real time, and so on. You have a lot of of problems to deal with, and uh, I I think that all the defense uh, devices today uh, are um, inefficient against this kind of missile. Uh, it, if I was asked. Personally, which is not the case, and this is why I can speak about it, uh, to design a, a, a counter weapon against this, uh, I, uh, probably I would I would go to some kind of railgun or a laser uh, weapon rather than a missile. You know, I don't believe really that we can have some missile which would be 
maneuverable enough to go against the target uh, flying at Mach 10. Uh, it doesn't seem re reasonable. <sighs> Over the last few years, the American government has been repeatedly saying that developing hypersonic missiles is a top priority, okay? Especially after 2019, when it became very clear the Chinese and the Russians were basically way ahead of the U.S. And to my knowledge, there are at least 10 separate projects that are currently undergoing. And in September 2021, the Pentagon said they had successfully tested advanced Mach 5 missiles developed by Raytheon in Northrop Grumman. And yet, in a recent article, you, you raised doubt about the likelihood that the West will ever be able to catch up to Russia and China in the development of hypersonic missiles. Okay, can you just explain to us what you meant by that and what led you to that conclusion? First of all, the US are targeting Mach 5. As I told you, this is the very beginning and the Russians are at Mach 27. So, you know, that there is a big gap uh, be between uh, both. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, they are not at the end of the difficulties they will encounter. In addition, uh, already uh, among the several 10 programs, uh, some have failed and were abandoned, uh, which uh, uh, proves that uh, uh, many among the best U.S. engineers are not able to successfully tackle this uh, field, uh, unfortunately. Uh, what about under such circumstances? The, problem faced by uh, uh, Mach 27 for the avant-garde, I, I told you about uh, before, but also Mach 9 at sea level, which is the Zircon. The Zircon for me is, uh, is the best, uh, I, I should say that, you know, uh, there is a problem of speed, but there is a problem of density of air in which you, you fly at which speed. And Mach 9 uh, at sea level is something incredible. Uh, so uh, the second point, in my opinion, is linked to the Western economic system. Its goal is to make money, only money. And uh, how many uh, good or very good engineers have been prevented from developing their inventions uh, because it didn't suit economic, financial, or even political interests. Uh, and uh, uh, let me take a French example. Uh, if you want to propose, say, a new missile uh, in uh, competition with NVDA, you know, uh, the, the, the big uh, uh, missile company in Europe and uh, has, who has the mono, which has a monopoly in France, then it is forbidden by the French government. You need to know this. If you, if you try this, you will fail. Uh, so, uh, you know, very difficult to, 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 to promote new ideas and disruptive ideas. Uh, then the third point is linked to, to the school and universities. Uh, the required level, at least in science, is not the right one uh, in the West, uh, globally, I would say. What we see uh, uh, in the West is a continuous decline in the level of students, which with some deep demagogy in giving them diplomas. Uh, when I was young, for example, uh, if you made five autograph mistakes in your text, you got a zero mark. <laughs> so now let me tackle the fourth point. The fourth point is linked to the research environment. Uh, imagine you have a breakthrough ID and you can't even publish it. So I'm going once again to give you a personal example, which I faced in 2014, so not so long ago. Uh, there was a specific disruptive conference in cryptography in San Francisco. Uh, its name was Catacrypt. You know, I even give the name of the conference. Uh, I was selected as one of the happy few, 12 speakers. And that night I had a discussion with uh, Jean-Jacques Wisquater, a very well-known worldwide uh, cri crypto uh, cryptologist. What, he did, uh, what did he tell me? Simply that the breakthrough you presented today is great, but you won't find any journal to publish it. And this is the fate of so many researchers. What they are asking you is to be aligned with the main flow. Uh, and that's all. Once I spoke with one of my colleagues in Airbus uh, and uh, explained him what I wanted to present at a conference. He told me, oh, you won't be selected. Uh, if you want to, just look at what has been published in the preceding two last years, and then propose a slight improvement of the subject of your choice. You know, that, and fortunately, uh, he was right. It does work like this. Because of this and many other reasons, the West will not catch up.
we are trapped into kind of a system and we cannot get out of it uh, unless it collapses maybe one day, I don't know. And uh, as a former engineer in the missile field, I told some friends of mine that uh, if they paid my company, I would design and, wor and uh, work out maybe a hypersonic missile. In the first time, uh, I said this in 2019, you know, not so long ago, and they believed I was cheating and that hypersonic, were in, uh, hypersonic missiles were impossible. You know, people working for the, the French military, uh, I, I, I need to say. And uh, when they realized that such devices existed, they disappeared from my radar. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and dealt with big companies whose outcome you know and is very poor. Right. That, that's it. You know, I, I think that uh, I, I had, you have a tour, basic tour of how things do work today and why I'm not very optimistic for the West. I mean, let's get into this a little bit more because I mean, I, I'm not. I mean, I, I, I don't. I'm, I'm not a scientist. I'm a social scientist. I know certainly, you know, within social science, there is a lot of basically, you know, political correctness yes. that has basically taken, you know, university departments by storm. In fact, you know, in social science, if you don't basically promote and push the right kind of agenda, you know, your 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 research is never going to basically see the light of day. But within science, how does that work in science, by the way? I mean, why, why, why do you have this? Because I mean, I, I assume the science is not very political. I mean, or has it become very political? It, I mean, is, it, is, it is, unfortunately, it is. You know, uh, just look at what happened during the, the COVID episode, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, the publications in medical sciences with the Lancet Gate and something like this, some things like this. Uh, you have also uh, an, another field, which is climate science. Uh, the guys who don't believe in climate change cannot publish, and uh, if they don't lose their job sometimes, uh, and so on, you know. So it depends on the uh, uh, on the level of interest you have. Uh, if if you are dealing with the science that nobody cares about, you know, <laughs> <laughs> probably you can publish anything you want. Nobody cares. Uh, on the contrary, if there are some big interest in it, climate change, uh, vaccines, uh, medical science, and so on, uh, you cannot. You cannot. But what you about in physics? I mean, what about in physics and in math and in engineering? Well, I've been living for some time, so I have some experience. Uh, I don't remember the year, but after 2010, I was able to, 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 to show that if you appeal to... Uh, what we call um, uh, formal logic in mathematics, you can prove that uh, uh, um, relativity theory and quantum physics are really incompatible. And I was, uh, and I'm still puzzled that there are some researchers who are paid to find a way to 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 make these two theories match. Because for me, it's definitive they cannot. We we will need to change them. I. I submitted a paper, um, I don't remember how many pages, but maybe seven or eight pages, something ser serious work, with a proof, mathematical proof. And you know, in my paper, I compared the relativity and the quantum physics as the two towers, main towers of physics, and they, that they were going to collapse. And the title of my paper was Physics 9-11. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't maybe four or five hours after posting it to the to the physics letter A, I received from the director of the journal, uh, your paper is not suited for publication in physics letter A. You know, <laughs> uh, I don't even know if he took the time to read it, uh, and I, I I answered him saying, uh, are you shocked by the title or uh, is it the content? Because I. If it was only the title, I could have changed it. It's not a problem. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't get any answer. You know, it works like this. Even fundamental physics. They're crazy. That's crazy. But but which basically brings me to my next question, which is obviously about where China and Russia come in, you know, right? Because, you know, I think in another article recently, you uh, you talked about how political freedom Yes, does not necessarily mean scientific freedom. And I think, you know, what you meant is exactly that in the West today, this democracy and so on and so forth, freedom of speech. 
And yet clearly there's no real scientific freedom where voices of dissent are simply not tolerated, okay? But if this is true, I mean, this obviously does not bode well for Western democracies in their battles against more authoritarian regime. But the question really is, I mean, you know, in authoritarian regimes like in Russia, in China, how do they promote scientific freedom? I mean, I mean, are they actually in a better place than democracy when it comes to scientific exploration? Uh, so for China, I don't know. Uh, for Russia, uh, I know more about USSR. And you know, I'm, I, I have a friend, uh, I had, unfortunately, he died two years ago, uh, who was a director of research at uh, French CNRS. And uh, he used to say uh, that he was from Russian origin. And he used to say that uh, in, uh, uh, in, in USSR, uh, there, uh, it was too big to be really, really managed. And uh, uh, it, it was, uh, uh, you know, there, there, were, there were always one place where the power could not uh, have a look uh, and uh, where people could do whatever they wanted. Uh, my own experience in Russia is that probably, yes, uh, you know, they are very far away from each other and, uh, you know, uh, fashion is uh, not, uh, doesn't contaminate that much uh, people there. Uh, but, you know, they, you need to know that they, the system is, uh, is heavy on us. In physics, for example, you need material, you need, you need the budget. And so uh, today, to, to get the budget, you need to fill in some papers to justify this. And, and, and unfortunately, you know, um, the ones who manage are the bad guys. And uh, when I say the bad guy, if you are a brilliant researcher, you will do research. You will not manage research. You see what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and so the managers are, are the bad guys and they don't have a clue. They are not able to understand if something is a real breakthrough, which is worth to be uh, pursued. And so uh, I, I had a friend, I, I will not tell his uh, name, but uh, he, he was Phil's Medal of Math, of Mathematics. Wow. And uh, due to this physics, I developed on them. I, 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 I tackled quantum physics through mathematics. And uh, I went to see him and I told him, so uh, look at this. Are you interested? Oh, yes, very interesting. And so on. Okay. So now, can you please select for me two of your best PhD students uh, for three years each so that uh, they come to, with me and we work on this? And do you know the answer? What? No, no, no. We will not give you these guys because it's a too complicated problem. And we need to ensure that our mathematicians will have a career. You know, these guys are civil servants for most of them. Which, which risk do you take tackling a too complicated problem? Uh, it's crazy. You, you, see, you see how it works. Okay. That so. is very interesting because in some sense, I mean, now I'm starting to think maybe the problem is not democracy, but the problem is capitalism, yes, because exactly. you know, because when you're operating in a capitalist system, you know, you have to basically like make money. You have to be able to justify what you're doing in terms of the productivity that is going to generate, and so on and so forth. So, from that point of view, people tend to be much more risk averse, you know, in a capitalist system. I mean, you tend to think that you know, capitalist system you're supposed to take risk, but they're taking basically very managed risk. You know, and then taking managed risk is what is detrimental, I guess, to creativity and to real breakthrough and disruptive uh, innovation, I guess. That's what you're saying. I, I, yes, I fully agree with you. Yeah. So from that point of view, the ch China and Russia, they're more backward in terms of the capitalist system with the state is much more powerful. And maybe that, you know, you know, motivated by the desire to exceed and excel, regardless of the cost. Yes, Maybe yes. that's when science can really basically take off because for both Russia and China, developing hypersonic missiles is presumably existential. It's not a question you can basically measure by money. Are we going to be able to sell this for how much money? That kind of thing. It's about the survival of their country. And maybe, you know, from that point of view, like money was no object, you know, in the quest for excellence. Right. Yes, this, this, this point is very important for me, what you say, because, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the characteristic of uh, uh, defense activities is that you, you are not looking for money and profitability, you are looking for supremacy. 
And the problem is that in the West, we have mixed uh, supremacy and uh, profitability. And this is why we are lagging behind the Russians and the Chinese, in my opinion. Yeah. I think you're right. And, and this, by the way, goes way beyond hypersonic missiles, of course. Now, for example, you know, certainly it's true probably in China's quest to develop basically an independent semiconductor industry. Because they feel like right now the U.S. is weaponizing semiconductors and trying to basically keep China back. So they're going to probably, <laughs> they're probably going to basically gather the brightest minds, spend all the money that's necessary to basically crack the puzzle. I mean, it's like in a war. You don't think about, okay, fine, maybe I want to hold something back. You feel like, you know, I got to do everything I can in order to basically not basically, uh, you know, basically perish, you know, in the race, right? Yeah, sure, sure. I fully agree. Iron Dome is now being replaced by this laser dome idea that they're going to use laser to take down basically these massive basically uh, strikes from potentially hundreds if not thousands of drones coming from Iran in a potential attack. I mean, how optimistic are you about like laser as a potential basically uh, anti-hypersonic weapons or just in general anti missile weapons? Uh, yes. So as I told you before, I, I would go this way. A lot of progress needs to be done uh, because, you know, a laser, when it's too powerful, uh, it diverges uh, today because it hits the hair around the laser and we have some, some kind of problems like this. Uh, so it, it, uh, it limits the range and the power you can send. But, uh, you know, impossible today, maybe possible tomorrow. We don't know. And this is a way. Another way I told you is ray guns. And uh, ray guns is interesting because, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's not that the speed of what we can send is uh, that, that high, two, three, five kilometers per second, which is not so bad, by the way. But uh, so Mac, ba basically between Mike 10 and 15. But the, the interesting point is that uh, it's not uh, um, photons, so it's a bit more massive, but it's very small. And so you cannot detect. So if you don't detect, you don't avoid. And you can make a lot of damage like this. So I would more rely on lasers uh, if we can manage these problems of power and over speed of shooting also, because uh, it's uh, you, you need to shoot uh, with very high frequencies and also with uh, uh, ray guns. Ray guns is, uh, is, might be a good opportunity to do this. Uh, and I, I have tricks for this, for the rail guns, I would have tricks, <laughs> not, not for lasers, <laughs> uh, to, to, to make it work. But I, I'm coming back on what you said, it's existential for, uh, for Israel, and they are in a hurry. Because you know, the, the hyper, we see it, uh, the, the Russians declared, I think by 2017, that they managed, uh, they were able to master uh, hypersonic missiles. Uh, and then China very soon uh, uh, said, oh, but we can do something. And so the technology diffuses uh, very quickly. And so Iran uh, might have some hypersonic missiles very, very soon and, and uh, many other countries and is going to diffuse everywhere. Uh, and in addition with this BRICS initiatives, initiative, the, the Russians might be tempted to help some of their friend friendly countries. And uh, so I think that uh, there, this is a real problem for Israel, a real one. Oh, I, I agree. I, I think it's a big problem for, every, for everybody, <laughs> yeah. basically. You're right. Right. Sure. Because also, as you said, you know, we didn't talk about this. It, it gives a country a first move advantage, actually. Right. Yes. Exactly. Because, you know, I mean, so, so from that point, the whole mutually assured destruction, you know, sort of philosophy sort of falls away when you have hypersonic missiles. <sighs> There is a tech war going on between the West and the global South, right? I mean, in some sense, that's what this is about. We can sit here and talk about geopolitical risk and this and that. In the end, I think what it comes down to very simply is a tech war, right? Because in some sense, the West has for many years enjoyed this huge lead and advantage when it comes to technology, which is able to monetize, right? By selling the technology at a very high price to poor countries, right? I mean, that's the difference between poor countries and rich countries, right? I mean, who's got a technology, he will get to monetize it, right? I mean, this is why, like, when Ericsson or Nokia bring their 5G equipment down to South America, 
you know, they sell them at prices that are exorbitant. And this is also the reason why now that Huawei, the Chinese company, goes down to Mexico and Brazil with their own 5G machine, literally a fraction of the cost of the Ericsson Nokia, you know, emerging market countries are now able to build out telecom network for the first time. So I've always said to some extent, I don't want to say this is always true, but to some extent, the Chinese could potentially can look at them, look upon themselves as Prometheus, right? Prometheus stealing basic fire from the heaven to bring it to God, to, to mankind, right? You know, so sort of it's one of these things. So therefore, and, and then obviously, you know, semiconductors are one area, hypersonics another area, AI is another area, but clearly another area is civilian aircrafts, right? There are only two major civilian aircraft manufacturers in the world, that's Airbus, and there's basically Boeing, and it stayed that way for a very long time. And then we know that both the Russians and the Chinese are now trying to basically build their own civilian aircraft, especially China. They have the largest market for civilian aircrafts. Now, the question is, how difficult is it going to be? Because like the Chinese have managed to develop this COMAC, okay, plane, but you know, the Chinese said only 40% of the components are imported, but others say basically maybe it's a lot more than that. You know, certainly the engines, okay, of the Chinese planes remain, you know, basically are imported from the U.S. So the question really is how difficult it is for China or Russia, for that matter, to play catch up in basically say, building their own civilian aircraft industry. And then if the U.S. were to decide one day, you know what, we want to stop China doing this for, too, we want to basically apply total sanctions on China's ability to buy any imported components, you know, how, diff how easy or difficult will be for the Chinese to overcome the, the, the sanctions? You need to know that today, 80% of Airbus backlog is made of the A320. Uh, 80%. This plane was designed in 1983, 40 years ago. For so Airbus is relying today on a 40 years old uh, uh, product. It's even worse for Boeing. The Boeing uh, 737 and its family, up to the max, uh, is 80% uh, uh, of, of its of its backlog. This is this is the market, you know. So the same for Boeing and for Airbus. But this plane was designed in 1967, so 56 years. So today, okay. And if you look at, uh, uh, maybe I can ask you a question: How many engineers are there in Airbus or in Boeing who are able? to make a new plane from scratch, from the blank sheet, from a blank sheet of paper, and not with, uh, not looking like uh, the A320 or the, or the B737. Zero, no one, no one. Nobody in these companies has ever made a plane. Uh, uh, so for, for the parts which are imported, uh, you know, uh, uh, and uh, your question uh, was on, on, on the engines, for example. Uh, which are, uh, uh, you know, uh, the technology is in the engines in, in, a, in, in a plane. But China is able to make uh, uh, fighters. If you can make fighters, why would you import, uh, uh, you know, parts from, from the West? Uh, and the same for, for the Russians. If you look at what happens with the sanctions in Russia, uh, they had their MS-21 and SSJ-100. In fact, both of these countries, China and Russia, uh, agreed to play the game of uh, globalization and agreed to share uh, part of, uh, uh, of the work uh, needed for, 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 for making their planes. You know, And of course, uh, they chose the best materials and the best competence where they are uh, at the time when, when they decided. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, in my opinion, they've been uh, deceived by the West. And now it's over. So they are going to develop their own technology. They have the means. Uh, they can make hypersonic missiles. They can make fighters. They can make, a lot, like, they can make a lot of things. So there is no problem at all for them. The problem is uh, competitiveness. I'm sorry for the Chinese, but they made a big mistake. Uh, the big mistake they made is, was to replicate the A320 and the B737. This is what they tried to do with, uh, with trying to, to get rid of the, the, the drawbacks of, of both of these planes. Um, I think that they should have better have 
developed a new plane from the blank sheet of paper. Even failing doesn't really matter in the beginning because they have time. And to create the breakthrough. Uh, because if they create, if one country, China or whoever, create a breakthrough in aerospace with the situation I described before, 40 year old plane, six, 56 year old plane, you will kill the competitors because they will not be able to react. But I, I think what you're saying actually is real indictment of the Western system, because if you look at the uh, silver every eight, you know, we're talking about Airbus and Boeing, right? I mean, these two companies have 100% <laughs> market share, right, of the um, of the civilian aircraft, basically markets, right? You know, Boeing's got 45%, Airbus 55%. Clearly, there's not that much competition. And maybe the lack of competition is the reason why that they're still sitting on planes that are 40, 50 years old in terms of when they were designed. I mean, there's no pressures to improve or to engage in disruptive thinking because there is no existential moment to force these companies to take risk, to think long-term, trying to be disruptive, right? If you compare an Airbus and the Boeing and you play at the game of the seven uh, differences, you know, uh, you won't find any seven differences uh, between uh, an Airbus and the, and the Boeing. They are exactly the same. I can tell you uh, an example, uh, personal one, once again. Uh, you know, we, we wanted to, uh, uh, it's fashion, to, to lower the consumption of a plane uh, when I was in Airbus. I, and uh, so I proposed the following thing. Uh, when you breathe air as a passenger in a plane, in fact, the, the air comes from the outside, goes through the compressor, is heated at 300 degrees, and then cooled at zero degrees before being re-injected in the cabin where you are. You know, so it's crazy to heat to 300 degrees and cool to, uh, you know, how, how much energy do you consume to do this? So I, I just remarked that in uh, submarines and nuclear submarines, the guys stay... Uh, under the water for six months, uh, or maybe more sometimes, and they they don't need to raise uh, the air from the outside. So, uh, and uh, uh, the longest trip in a plane is about fifteen or sixteen hours. So, you, no problem. Just just let us put in place the same system, the same device, and as in the submarines. You know what? It's forbidden by the law. Because there is a law saying, a rule that you need to breathe when you are in a plane, the outside air. You know, this is crazy. And I said, but let's change it. No, 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 we won't change it. Not for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, right. 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 But I, th I think you make a very profound point here, which is that, you know, I think, you know, the point here is that, you know, in some sense, there's this convergence you call it mean, but you could also call it convergence to mediocrity, you know? Yes. And in some sense, the capitalist system encourages that, you know, to some extent, because also people get used to a certain, you know, basically norm. Also, you have regulations that tend to basically reinforce a certain norm. So as a result, basically everybody is just trying to be just okay. Just think about Toyota in the last few years, they decided they didn't want to go down the path of, you know, investing heavily into EV electric vehicles because they believe that the more energy efficient way is hybrid. And they were punished and punished and punished by the market, right? I mean, the stock completely out underperformed so on and so forth. And now perhaps, you know, people are starting to come around. Maybe hybrid makes more sense, you know, when we haven't got enough lithium, cobalt, and actually creating EVs might be actually more environmentally damaging, you know? So I think from that point of view, like, you know, it, it does require the willingness to think out of the box and then not many people are capable of doing that today for the same performance as a traditional car uh, you have a an overweight of uh, uh, between 600 and 800 depending on the models uh, kilograms additional uh, i've been working with people from porsche and uh, uh, so 100 kilograms additional is equivalent to uh, 0.5 uh, liter per 100 kilometers in addition. So 800 kilo, kilogra uh, kilograms in addition means four uh, uh, liters per 100 kilometers more 
people who have uh, uh, who own electric uh, vehicles or um, hybrid don't see this because you know they consume some kind of electricity and something like this. But it's it's a uh, it's, uh, uh, for engineers, it's a real nightmare, you know, because today we are developing cars which consume more energy than traditional ones, uh, but they are electric and uh, it's magic. <laughs> <laughs> John Francois, thank you so much. You know, this was very enlightening. I learned a lot. I'm sure my viewers are going to basically learn a lot. And thank you so much for being candid and honest and giving your real opinion. I think it's really much value. Thank you. Thank you so much for this interview. Thank you so much. Yeah. If you got something out of this program, please hit like and subscribe to my free YouTube channel. Let me know what you think by posting your comments on the video. If you want to learn more about my investment strategy, come visit us at davidwuunbound.com.